There you go. That sounds good. It says, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew. Everybody say Andrew. <laughs> Simon Peter's brother. Verse 41 said, he first finds his own brother, Simon. That's so important there. And says unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Verse 42 and he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said this. This is what Jesus said. It says, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is in by interpretation a stone. This is, to me, so important. We read, the, as Sister Sandy says, we read the Bible way too fast. There's something in this scripture that we have overlooked, and I'm going to share that with you in this message that we've titled, It's a Wonderful Life. It's a Wonderful Life. Amen. Take your neighbor by the hand as a point of contact and a sign of unity, and let's ask God's blessings upon this word. Father, we love you, and we're so thankful, Lord, for this privilege to be in your house. We ask that this word will go forth in power and in demonstration of your spirit, a powerful seed planted in good ground to bring forth much fruit. And Holy Spirit, I felt your presence in this room. Continue to lead and guide and direct us. Bring all things back to our remembrance. What service has been spoken? What service has been written? Give us insight for our eyesight. Open our ears that we may hear what you are saying to the church. And when we leave this place, we will bear much fruit and continue to operate in your gifts. So confirm your word with signs and wonders. In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody says... Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you for standing in reverence of the reading of God's Word. So, it's a wonderful life. I love this background here because, honestly, this is something that I have really never thought about. And it really helps me understand this whole concept of, of people are our greatest investment. That we sometimes in life get in too, in too much of a hurry. We miss out the very gifts that God puts in our hands. I have been doing something the last couple of weeks. I've been reviewing our services since we've been online. Actually, we started online a long time ago. I don't even remember exactly what year, but I remember we were with a different company. It was absolutely free, and uh, we just were just started doing it. And then we built upon that, and lo and behold, we found out that it was a need. We had to do that because of what COVID brought to us. But I was reviewing some of the earlier videos, and it was it was people that are no longer here. Uh, some of them went on to their reward in heaven. I was thinking of, of Brother Gene and watching him. I was looking at uh, Brother Frank Bird was standing over there. And I just saw the different people that were in here. I saw Ethan standing there. And it, was just, it just brought back some memories. And thinking about, you know, you never know how good things are until those things are no longer in your life. And sometimes we think... You know, I, 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 have, I have conditioned my mind to uh, look at things a little more positive than I used to, used to have, especially with going through this embarkment syndrome and dealing with the ongoing 24-7, uh, feeling like I'm on a boat, feeling like, you know, things are just, they're just waving around everywhere. I've conditioned my mind to, you know, have a better attitude and things. And so I walk in in the morning sometimes and when <clears throat> almost every day I'm doing laundry and uh, I walk in and I, I've told Caleb, I've told Levi so many times, hang your towel back in the bathroom. But where is it at? It's on the closet floor, as usual. And the reason I ask him to do that, because, you know, bending down, standing up, bending down is not real healthy for me if I do a, quite a bit of it. And so I take it, and then I, I really, part, the, the part of me, the old nature, wants to say, hey, I told you to put this up and just get on to them and, you know, give them a piece of my mind. But then the spiritual part, the good part, the Christian part, the Jesus part says, hey, these boys, you know, you don't have, you don't know how much longer you may have. You may get to life, uh, sometime in your life missing picking up those towels. 
And that's the truth, you know, and that's where we're headed. We're, we'll eventually, as the Lord comes, we'll eventually be empty nesters and we'll be saying bye to all of them. Of course, uh, except for Macy. Macy, we're, we're going to keep her as long as we can. But, um, you know, I look at that and I see people's lives and their transitions. I hear uh, it's, all, it's, it's incredibly quiet at the house. It's incredibly quiet. But when Levi comes home, it is so loud. He's playing the keyboard. He's cutting up. He's having fun with the family, you know. He's saying, you know, just being Levi. And, you know, one of these days, you know, we may not have that. And so I think about that. And I think how important it is to invest in them and to love them and to just be appreciative. But when that person or those memories are gone, that's all they become is memories. And so I look at this story of Andrew. Andrew was Peter's brother. And when you look at the disciples, you don't think about Andrew, do you? You think of Peter, you think of James, you think of John. Some of you probably think of Matthew because he was a tax collector. But we don't really talk about Andrew, although Andrew was a part of the inner circle. He's, we don't even know very much about his background. The Bible's not very clear. It's not very coruscated on, on who Andrew was. And, but we do know this one thing. Andrew was used in a mighty way. And we've missed it. We've missed it. I like what um, Homer Lindsay identified Andrew as. He basically said that Andrew was called the inviter. That's who Andrew was. He's the one that brings people to Christ. He's the one that introduced Peter to Jesus. Without Andrew introducing Peter to Jesus, we would never, ever have read of Peter walking on the water. Without Andrew introducing Peter to Jesus, we would have never read about Peter cutting off a man's ear (laughs) with a sword. We would have never read about Peter on the day of Pentecost standing in front of thousands of people and explaining to them out of the prophet Joel that this was a prophetic, um, uh, you know, prophetic word that was being seen at that day. And then we never saw 3,000 people come to the Lord, being added daily in the day of Pentecost, without that inviter. Now, sometimes in life we we think that what we do is insignificant. Maybe you're not up here preaching. Maybe you're not up here uh, playing an instrument or leading praise and worship. Or maybe you're not even part of the, the, really part of the church. You just, you come and you sit. Uh, But there's something important for all of us. And that is that not only all are, are we not all called to preach, but we're all called to reach. And you being an inviter may be the most important part of the growth of Gospel Lighthouse Church. Just inviting one person. I want you to see this. I thought this was so incredible because um, I've heard this before. And I found this really interesting, but when I read this particular, this particular, um, um, I guess you would say, story, it really challenged me. It helped me understand a little more deeper than the story that I heard before. Has anybody ever heard of the man Edward Kimball? Raise your hand if you ever heard of Edward Kimball. I know some of you may have, but when I begin to read this, you will find out that, hey, yeah, I remember Edward Kimball. He was a Sunday school teacher, Edward Kimball, and he was the one who led a man by the name of D.L. Moody to Christ. Edward did this. He went to a Boston shoe store where this 18-year-old Moody was working, uh, cornered this young man, Moody, in a stock room, and he introduced him to Christ. But listen to this story. I never knew this. Kimball was anything but bold. 
When I thought of Edward Kimball at first, I thought, oh man, he must be a guy that's on fire for God. He must be someone that is just out there on the streets and he's just witnessing, going door to door, you know, always banging on the door, inviting people to Christ. But that was not Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball was not a bold person. In fact, he was timid. Edward Kimball was soft-spoken. He went to that shoe store frightened that day trembling and unaware of whether he had the courage to confront this young man with the gospel, Moody. On the other hand, Moody was crude. He was obviously illiterate, and Kimball trembled in his boots as he recalled the incident. Moody had begun to attend a Sunday school class Moody was totally untaught and ignorant about the Bible, Kimball said. And this is what he says. He says, I decided to speak to Moody about Christ and about his soul. I started downtown to Holton's shoe store. When I was nearly there, I began to wonder whether I ought to go just then during business hours. And I thought maybe my mission might embarrass the boy. But when I went away, the other clerks might ask who I was. And when they learned my taunt, uh, when they learned my taunt Moody and ask if I was trying to make a good boy out of him. While I was pondering over it all, I passed the store without noticing it. Then when I found I had gone by the door, I determined to make a dash for it and have it over at once. Kimball found Moody in the stockroom, spoke to him with uh, what he calls limping words. And later he said, I never could remember what I said, something about Christ and his love. That was all he admitted. It was a weak appeal, but Moody then, right then and there, gave his heart to Christ. Now think about this. Here you have D.L. Moody. Tens of thousands testified that they came to Christ under D.L. Moody's ministry. In fact, my father-in-law, Dwight, is named after D.L. Moody. Moody led C.T. Studd, the great pioneer missionary, and William Chapman, who himself became a well-known evangelist to Christ. Moody found the Moody Bible Institute that has trained thousands for ministry. It all began when one was faithful to in introduce another to Christ. Edward Kimball is the Andrew. He's the one that's just like, you know, I don't want to be all seen. I don't want to be all heard, but I just want to be used of God. And he had a burden to go and to just speak to one person. When I think about that in my life. I think about the times when people have approached me and talked to me about Christ when I was away from God. I was a young man. I was, I was just fresh out of high school. I was going into uh, college at Southwestern Oklahoma State University. I was going just to major in, you know, just a regular general study. And I'll never forget my friend who is a world-renowned pianist, jazz pianist. And he has a, uh, his own little, I guess you would call a club in downtown Dallas. And I remember him, he said, hey, why don't you come this summer and spend a couple of weeks, or a couple of days anyway. He was trying to get me to go to the, to the school at North Texas. And he said, why don't you come and just you know, bring a trombone and, and maybe think about being a part of North Texas University, because that's where he was going to go to school. And I was like, I don't know. And he's like, oh, come on. And so me and my buddy, we went down there. I'll never forget this. We spent the night with uh, my friend and... Uh, that evening, he said, let's go to West End, which if you've ever been to Dallas, West End is the part of the, uh, of the city where there's a lot of clubs and a lot of things that go on. And here I am, I'm 18 years old, and I'm searching for a direction in my life. And um, I remember walking with my friend Brad, and we went by this guy, and he was out on this patio, and he was playing the piano, and he was singing. He was doing a lot of Billy Joel songs. And uh, Brad looked at me, and he said, that's what I want to do. And I was like, hey, that's pretty cool, you know. And when I was walking, we were headed, I kid you not, we were headed back to our uh, vehicle. And I'm away from God. I'm not really serving the Lord like I should. And I'm in between, trying to, a crossroads, trying to make a decision about what my future needs to be. Because my father had just died, and I'm just trying to search 
And this girl who was about my age comes out of nowhere. I didn't know who she was. I didn't know what she wanted, but I knew when she walked across, something was going to take place. She, she singled me out of all of my friends. She singled me out, and she handed me a tract. And, she, and the tract said, what do you need to do to be saved? She was witnessing to me about Christ. And I thought, man, why didn't you talk to my friend? They need it more than I do, right? Why didn't you talk to them? And it wasn't that. That had nothing to do with it. It was God. He was orchestrating the whole set. It was a setup from him. He was trying to get a hold of my heart and say to me, JC, the only way, the only true direction for your future is to follow me, to search me, to live for me. And man, that really, and I never got that out of my mind. I never, I never could get away from that, that one invitation. And see, you could be that person. You could be that person that can just make one invitation, invitation to someone that maybe perhaps you didn't even, they don't even know you, but you have planted a seed or perhaps even watered a seed in their life and made such a difference. This is what is so, in, 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 I think, amazing on this first, this outline here. The, the first thing we see is this. He saw the value of indo, individual uh, people. And you can put that on the screen. Andrew appreciated the value of a single soul. And that's why we say people are our greatest investment. We should never underestimate the value of a single person because they are so valuable to God that God sent his own son, Jesus, to planet Earth to die for all humankind. And so I, I think that's great. Um, he brought Peter to Jesus, just one. That's all he did. But think about this. He brought the boy with his lunch to Jesus. It was just one. That's all it was. Just one person. Just one person. And in turn, that one person changed the scope of, of destiny in people's lives. And I love this. Number two, we saw this. He saw the value of insignificant gifts. Some people see the big picture more clearly just because they appreciate the value of small things. Like in the feeding of the 5,000 story, uh, Philip's vision was, was overwhelmed by the size of the need. Think about that. He said in John chapter 6, verse 8 and 9, he said, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they uh, uh, with so many? I mean, that is, that is us. You know, we, we look at that, but there's so much value even in the insignificant features of people. He looked up in Luke 21 and verse 1. He looked up and he saw the rich uh, dropping their offerings. This is, this is the, the insignificant value from the side of Jesus. Jesus looks up and he saw the rich dropping their offerings into the temple treasury. Then he also saw a poor widow dropping in two tiny coins. And he says, truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all of them for all these people have put in gifts out of their surplus. But she out of her poverty has put in all that she has to, has to live with. And that's amazing. The value in insignificance. And so I think that is important. The third thought is this. He saw the value of inconspicuous service. Andrew is a picture of those who, laborly, who labor quietly and humble before the Lord. I think of the person in my life that had more influence than anyone else, growing up especially, was my grandmother Brown. Grandmothers, you, you're here this, this morning. You have so much influence in people's, in these children, your grandchildren, more than you'll ever imagine. I look at my grandmother, and who, who, born in 1908, she remembers uh, her traveling from Missouri to Kansas to Oklahoma, and she said, John Kerry, I saw, as I was traveling to, to Oklahoma, I saw, in a covered wagon, by the way, she says, I remember seeing the Indians in teepees in, in Oklahoma. I mean, that's amazing. And her story is incredible. 
And she wasn't out to become, you know, a movie star, to become real famous. No, she had a mission, and that was to see her children saved and her grandchildren saved. Had 12 children, 12 children. She never had her driver's license. Can you imagine that? She depended on others to take her around. She, at, when my mother was, uh, I believe she was two years old, my grandpa, Grandpa Brown, Grandma Brown's husband, he accidentally fell out of a pickup truck and was killed. And she ne- my grandmother Brown never married, having all those children, never married. Then a few years later, the Sunday school teacher was dropping off my, my mother and her twin brother, Gary Dallas, and the Sunday school teacher didn't realize that Gary Dallas had went back into the back of the car to get a little Sunday school pamphlet that he had forgotten. And the Sunday school teacher backed over Gary Dallas and killed him. My grandmother Brown dealt with all that. My grandmother Brown outlived so many of her own children. She had several strokes. She had uh, shingles. She, she dealt with so much. But you know, I never heard her complaining about about it and I would always <laughs> I'd always see her sitting at the table when I would come over a little kid and her Bible was always open and she was always studying the Word of God and she had writing I remember she had a stroke when I was living in Arkansas living as a bachelor up in north central Arkansas she had a stroke and she could not use her right right arm anymore and I remember she would write me letters with her left hand Sydney, man, that's, I mean, that person, not out looking for accolades of man, just loves people and sees the investment, how important it is to invest in people's lives. And she would sit at a Singer sewing machine, you've heard me tell the stories, and she would make quilts, she would make all kinds of clothes. They, she never went clothes shopping. <laughs> she made her own pants her own clothes her slacks she made everything her little her little gowns and everything she made she made them all with that singer sewing machine but the pastor when he was uh officiating the, the her funeral he stood up there and he read all the nations and in the world that she would spend the day making these bible little things, notes and whatever and clothes and she would send them to the missionaries and the missionaries would take them and there is even a story of a, of a, of a young little um, Af- I guess he was a little village boy in Africa that had, had found one of the things that she had sent and showed the missionary and the missionary showed the pastor who officiated that Man, sitting at a 1018 East Riley in El Reno, Oklahoma, in that little bitty bedroom with that Singer sewing machine and literally winning thousands to the Lord. Who's your one this morning? Who is your one? Who's the one that you decided, hey, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to reach them. I'm going to... I'm going to do whatever it is. Listen to what Ephesians 6 says. It says, don't work only while being watched as people pleasers. It says, but as workers of Christ, do God's will from your heart. So many times we just want to do something to be seen. We're in such a visual age where I've got to have a selfie of me doing things. Churches are all about that now. We got to have a selfie, but here you have <laughs> you have people like Andrew said, "Hey, I'm I'm not looking for the credit." Can we get to the point where all glory belongs to God? Can we get to the point in our life where I just want to bring Him glory? It's all about Him, not about me. It's all about Him. Let's stand together in this room. Tradition has this, that Andrew took the gospel north into the nation of Russia or the country of Russia. He even, they even say, historians say that Andrew could
could have went as far as to Scotland. But we read something that happened to Andrew. Andrew was crucified in a place called Achaia, which is in the southern part of Greece. One account says that Andrew had led a wife of a, of a very prominent Roman governor to Christ and that it, it made this governor so mad, it infuriated him. He demanded that his wife um, recant the devotion of Jesus Christ. She refused. She said, I'm not going to do that. So the governor had Andrew crucified. Historians say that Andrew was lashed. He wasn't nailed to the cross, but he was lashed to the cross in order to prolong his suffering. Tradition also says that the cross that Andrew was put on was not the, the cross that we would think like that, but it was a T-shaped, but it was actually an X-shaped. They say that Andrew hung on that X-shaped cross for two days. And while he was hanging there, Andrew would exhort to the people that pass by, give your life to God. As he was dying on the cross, Andrew was saying, serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. Live for God. What a dedication to God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your word. You're challenging us this morning about being very, very cautious to those that are around us. To reach them. To not miss it. But to see the value in everyone. Just like Father... Christ saw the value in Andrew, and Andrew saw the value in Peter, and Peter saw the value in thousands. Lord, I, make us an Andrew today. Make us an Andrew. In Jesus' name. While your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, and you say, you know, what you're talking about, I can feel the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart because I know that I need Christ. I need Christ in my life. I need Him to, to help me. And I'm away from Him, and I want to make things right. I want to know before I walk out of these doors in this sanctuary that my life is in the hands of God. That I am completely, completely knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm a born-again believer. You know, shaking the pastor's hands or even coming to church or even doing good things is not enough. We must be born again. You're here this morning and you say, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not born again. I'm, not, I'm, I'm away from God. But I just want to make a commitment today to know that I know that I know that my life is born again. If that's you with an uplifted hand, say, pray for me, Pastor J.C. Pray for me. I see your hand. Yes, yes, yes. Anyone else? Anybody else? I want to make a commitment to Christ and follow Him. Hallelujah. Father, thank you so much. This is what I like to do. We've been doing it every, every Sunday on this series. I like for you to get out of your seats and get with about four or five people and just gather around and pray for one another and pray that um, you would see the value in people even if they may in your eyes seem insignificant that you will see the value so we have two young men that are on the front pastor carl pastor jamie if you guys can come and adopt them i see brother vernon's here but just go around and and get with some people and let's pray for one another and let's encourage